Okay, so if you uh, got the handout for tonight uh, in your email, you'll know that we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 11. And uh, this is a theological landmine to walk through to get uh, an understanding of what Paul's trying to do. Um, I think when I get to meet the Apostle Paul, I will ask him why he made chapters 9 through 11 such a difficult uh, maze to walk through. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to try to understand the purpose of Romans 11. So we have looked at the book of Romans a little bit differently, as you know. We started at the back of the book, and we've kept creeping toward the front. But after tonight, we're ready to then go to chapter one and go sequentially from chapter one through chapter eight, because we've put all the pieces in place that we need to understand the potential purpose for what Paul is trying to accomplish in this letter. So in this particular chapter, there is a concern that the apostle is trying to address, and you can see it on the slide, the haunting question, has God rejected his people? Now, the reason that question comes up is Paul chooses to quote from Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2, in the previous verse at the end of chapter um, 10. So if you take a look at that verse, it says, but concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So with that setup, the question then comes in the first verse of chapter 11. I ask then, did God reject his people? So that's the question that he's trying to address in this particular chapter in light of the long history of Israel's disobedience, um, their failure to keep God's uh, intentions and purposes and at times his laws, uh, there is this question that is lingering, looking back on history, has God had enough? Has God had enough with the nation of Israel? And is he restarting with a new people, the Gentiles? But you'll notice in verse 1 of chapter 11, he has that strong response. He says, did God reject his people? And then he says, by no means. So in this very dramatic response, he has set himself up that he has to address the question of what is happening in light of the Roman house churches having a mixture of Gentiles and Jewish people, as well as what is God doing with the chosen nation, not just individuals within the nation, and how does that relate to the Gentiles? So what he does here in this chapter is deal with all of those questions. However, what we're going to see in this chapter is the way he goes about it. He uses a couple of examples, and he uses some uh, metaphors to try to explain it. So in that, we need to kind of work with it and tease it out a little bit to see what he's trying to do. Uh, interspersed in there are some additional Old Testament quotations. Um, and so with all of these components, um, it's not easy for us who are living several thousand years later to figure out what Paul's trying to do as a, uh, a previous Pharisee and rabbi in dealing with his people. But we'll give it our best shot. And uh, before I actually get into the content of it, uh, do you have any questions that I can clarify? We looked at chapters 9 and 10 last week. Uh, anything I can answer before we dive into chapter 11? Okay, so I want to read verses 1 through 10. And then we'll come back and tease it out a little bit. It says in verse 1, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? 
Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, here's the first of an Old Testament quotation. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, a second Old Testament quotation, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Okay. So, in this paragraph, the question comes up, who is he addressing? We've tried elaborately to explain that there are two types of people he's talking to in this book. One group is called the strong. The other group is called the weak. The strong are the Gentiles that look down upon Jews that are still trying to keep the Torah the weak are those Torah-observing Jews that think that um, the Gentiles are, um, are being disobedient to God because they are not observing Torah law. So can you imagine, as the house churches get started in Rome, this question probably is a tension point almost every Sabbath. So you have those that are Torah observant and those who are not. It probably would be the question that Paul had to deal with even as he went through Asia Minor on his missionary journeys when his first stop was always at a synagogue. And that tension is found in the book of Acts. So there's an introduction here, uh, and it seems to be addressed to the Jewish side, and that is the remnant. So we see here in this passage, he's going to use two examples, and then he's going to introduce three terms that, uh, to try to get to the heart of what is happening. So as he does so, he first identifies himself as an Israelite, a true Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So the first example is he is kind of the embodiment of all the privileges that Israel had, the scriptures, the law, the prophets, the miracles that God did, the Exodus, the Passover, all of those types of things, the tabernacle, the temple. He recognizes that he is part of a lineage that is the embodiment of all of Israel's privileges. So he sees himself as an example, though, of one who came to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And his point, it seems, to be trying to challenge his fellow Jews who have not crossed that line of faith yet to join him in doing so. But in the first five verses, he is really emphasizing to the weak, quote unquote, that not only is he using himself as an example, he pulls out the name of Israel's predominant prophet. Uh, this prophet, Elijah, and the story concerning Elijah is found in 1 Kings 17 through chapter 19. And we talked about Elijah, Elijah on Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so we might be familiar with the story of how he challenges the prophets of Baal. Um, he calls upon the Baal prophets to light an altar uh, by calling upon their God. Nothing happens. Elijah calls down fire. The altar is lit, 
and everyone recognizes that Yahweh is the true God. So Elijah then succumbs in weakness to a threat by an, a woman named Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, and he runs. And as he flees, what we see is his primary, primary complaint is quoted here in verse three, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left. They're trying to kill me too. So at that point, he is hiding out in a cave. And if you want to know the rest of the story, uh, God passes by, not in an earthquake, not in a fire, but in a whisper. And what we find is God tells Elijah to go back and to finish the work that he has called him to do. So Elijah is in, in many ways appealing to God, as it says here in verse 2, he appealed to God against Israel, against those who uh, had uh, committed apostasy, who had fallen away from the covenant. So Elijah is kind of a critic, not kind of, he is a critic of his own people. And he's unaware that there are anybody else, there is anybody else that is faithful but him. And God tells him, no, I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee, knee, uh, knee to Baal. So too, at this present time, there's a remnant. And that's a word you should probably circle. It's kind of the key of what Paul is trying to get at. There's a remnant that has chosen to accept Christ as Messiah. And he's trying to convince the rest of the Jewish population to do the same thing. Does that make sense? In that, so two examples, himself and Elijah are people that were faithful in following God. And that becomes the impetus to cause other Jews to cross the line of faith. Now, the first theological difficulty here is, well, are these Jews unbelievers? Well, the way this reads, it seems as though they are. However, in the previous chapters, we've looked at it in Romans, they both sides are believers in Jesus, and uh, yet one is called the weak and the other is called the strong. So that's, that's a problem area that theologians wrestle with. Who is really the audience that chapter 11 is addressing? So let me stop there and see if you have some thoughts or questions, comments, or insights. I have a question about this remnant. Yeah. Is that, um, is that uh, the same as the 144,000 and like revelations that they're, they're called the remnant too? Is that right? Uh, no, there is, this is a group of people in the city of Rome that Paul is trying to convince that Jesus is Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the expectation of the Jews. The book of Revelation, um, well, that's a whole another side conversation. Uh, the 144,000 is a symbolic number. And it is a number that represents all the 12 tribes of Israel. However, the fact of the matter is by the time John the Revelator writes the book of Revelation, um, many of the tribes have already gone out of existence uh, because of the Babylonian and Assyrian um, exile. So it's, it, it, Revelation is apocalyptic literature. Uh, Romans is an epistle, a letter. So it's two different types of material. And in Revelation, a lot of that is symbolic. The whole book is symbolic. And um, so uh, don't, don't try to equate the two. This is, they have no relationship to each other. Okay. 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 
Uh, you're referring to the in, in Romans here. So I know you can't hear because the microphone doesn't pick up um, surrounding voices. As he was just saying, it, uh, when you think about fabric, um, which remnant of fabric is, is not really the same thing, but she's drawing the ideal that the idea that you use fabric and you have leftover fabric and you call that fabric a remnant that um, that could be used for other projects, right? Yeah. But it's not a part of the primary project. Right. So um, in this case, then the remnant is are those individuals, are you thinking they are people that are still on the edge and they haven't made a commitment? Oh. Yeah. Okay. But the remnant here are believers, I think. And the term here is describing a group of people that have actually crossed the line of faith, at least in Romans. Now, in the illustration that he's using with Elijah, you might say the remnant are those 7,000 out of the nation of Israel that did not bow the knee to Baal. That they're, they are what's left. They left, they left what? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Now I'm connecting. Okay. Ah, okay. This is a great, interesting angle. Really good. So what Esty's point is, is that the remnant are those that after they were dispersed out of Rome by Claudius, the emperor, it's the remnant that comes back to Rome. There are still other Jews dispersed through other territory, that the remnant is a group of people that came back, settled back in Rome, picked up their businesses again, and now we're trying to assimilate into the house churches in Rome. That's a real good insight. The leftover of the initial group. Yeah, they're, they're a leftover of the initial group that was in Rome of Jewish mm -hmm. people. But, well, it's it's kind of a theological. Yeah, but we're using it here in an English sense, but a remnant here is as you can see with the Elijah illustration, are the faithful people. It's not the people that are left over and kind of wasted material. I mean, they are the individuals that are at the core of following God. So you gotta be careful, even though you can draw some analogies, you have to be careful. Uh, Paul's not using that term the same way we might, you know, so. Welcome to Romans 11. It's not an easy chapter to figure out. Okay, let's keep going. So now, here's a good one. He uses three terms. So he's used two examples, himself and Elijah. And he's going to introduce three terms. And the first one is election. So in verse two, it's implied and in verse seven, it's named. So it says here, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew, okay? The idea that God had a working knowledge of this group of people. But jump down to verse seven, the word is introduced here. What then, what the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. Now here's the word, the elect among them did, but the others were hardened. Now, theologically, election, most people refer to those that are chosen for salvation. That's not what this chapter is about. The elect has something to do with the entirety of the nation of Israel was the nation that God worked through. But it says here, what the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain, but the elect among them did. 
So the idea here of the elect is related to the remnant, that small group of people that believed and continued to follow God. So what's hard about this here is how he goes into quoting from the Old Testament. So if you have your study Bible, you'll see that if you look down at the bottom margin, uh, it says here that this particular quotation is a combination of Deuteronomy 29.4 and Isaiah 29.10. Okay, Paul, thanks a lot for taking two verses and smushing them together. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear to this very day. You know what Paul is doing here? He's doing what is called Jewish midrash. And that is giving a different meaning to the text for his own purposes. That's not what that means back in the two references that he is quoting here. That's not the context. But what he does is he takes a common Jewish technique of reaching into a body of material, pulling out what he wants and compressing it together. So we do that at times when we quote songs or quote speeches. We take little bits out. So I have a dream, right? Okay, Martin Luther King. Uh, we just came past Mar uh, Martin Luther King Day. And we all know that. I have a dream. And, and someday we're going to enter the promised land and justice will roll like a river and stuff. But we don't know the whole speech. We only pull out that part and we use it in different contexts to um, pursue justice and to fight against racism and different things like that. That's what Paul's doing here as well. Paul knows that God worked within the nation of Israel. And he, he says that God foreknew that there was going to be an issue that some people within Israel would not believe. And then he goes into the Old Testament, into Deuteronomy and Isaiah, and says, oh, that's a fulfillment of what has already been said. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this is all using the scripture as, as, um, as kind of a... a I don't want to use the word power play, but in a sense it is. It's kind of a way of grabbing the attention of the Israelites and forcing them to sit up and take notice. So he is doing in, in a way a little bit of manipulation uh, of their emotions. And he does the same thing when he goes down into verse nine. Again, if you're looking at your study Bible, that comes out of Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23. May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Well, David is referring to his enemies in the Psalm. He's not referring to his own people. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting the way Paul does some some midrash here and uses these texts for another purpose. He's setting them up as if they have no hope, this elect people that they have lost their position. Mm -hmm. And is there a way that they can get back into the good graces of God? So that's kind of what he is doing is setting them up. And it's for the later part of chapter 11 because he's going to make a, a statement down at the end of the chapter which is quite confusing as well where it will say down in chapter 11 verse 26 all israel will be saved so that we'll get to that in a second but let me have i confused you this is not easy Okay, let's see if the next term helps us a little bit. So now he talks about a remnant in verse five. Okay, so at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. 
Now, this is where a lot of the theologians get this idea that God predestines individuals to a destiny. Again, he's talking about a group of people that God used for a couple thousand years um, in the Old Testament. What we find is that he then talks about grace, and God is choosing here a, a group of people that, I guess, wake up, their eyes are open, that Torah observance was doing something else. It really wasn't earning a merit with God, because God always operates on the basis of grace through faith. So if that's the case, then what is the Torah for? Well, it was to structure a nomadic people into a nation and to establish justice among them. But it wasn't a means by earning God's favor. And yet to this very day, and you don't even have to be Jewish to think this, you, if you ask a person, you know, uh, how do you get right with God? Well, a lot of people will say you keep the, what, Ten Commandments, right? You keep the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments is at the heart of a covenant that is meant to establish justice in a newly formed nation. It was never meant as a means of earning righteousness uh, in God's eyes. That's why Paul will use Abraham so often as an example of an individual who is justified by faith. So anyways, the remnant are those that get it. They wake up to it. They realize that uh, God has always been full of grace and mercy. And now they find that embodied in the person of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. And then there'll be a third term. The third term is in verses five and six as well, and it's the word grace. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. And if it were, grace would no longer be grace. So the word grace is used four times in these couple of verses here. So what do we mean by that? Well, we tend to acronym things in English Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Have you ever heard that acronym? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's fun, but it's not true. I mean, in the, not the, 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 and I'm not saying what it represents is not true, but grace is this idea of God uh, graciously giving what we cannot earn. Uh, and so here's kind of a phrase that, I picked up out of um, Scott McKnight's book. Grace here means it is the work of God, which is the priority, is abundant in sufficiency and efficacy in redemption, which allows the superabundance of God's um, uh, actions toward a person and is incongruous with a person's status and Torah observance, incongruity. So he's, he talks about the idea you can't accept grace and try to earn favor with God at the same time. That's maybe an easier way of saying it. Is it works? Then it's works. If it's grace, it's grace. Neither the two shall cross over each other. So what Paul's trying to make clear is God has always worked on the basis of grace. Work, works could establish a person's status among other people, a sense of their worth. Isn't that person a godly individual, that type of thing? Um, but grace disestablishes the honor code that the weak, and I put that in parentheses there, they keep trying to hold on to Torah observance to show that they are better than their Gentile counterpart. So the weak here want some type of proof that God has worked this way all along. And so here you see those four, um, uh, three books and four verses uh, that he quotes from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Psalm. So what Paul is doing is he's kind of pulling out his 
ability to argue for grace, dipping back into the Old Testament and talking about how people who couldn't see that it was grace all along had a spirit of stupor. Their eyes couldn't see, their ears couldn't hear, um, <laughs> that type of thing, which might be true, but that would have been hard to sort through at the time. Think about this for a moment. If you were born in ancient Israel and every surrounding tribe uh, and nation around you all used sacrifices as a means to appease your God, that would be your natural default. That's how you would look at religion too. So in some ways, Paul's being a little rough on his, his Jewish ancestors. But at the same time, what he's trying to do is push these weak people, again, weak in quotations, to realize that the only way this house church in Rome is ever going to work is if they both realize it's by God's grace. God's grace alone. Does that make sense to everybody? So we give up all our pride that we're better than somebody else because we're holding to some type of standard that the other group isn't, and I'm better than they are. At the heart of this is a pastoral concern for these people in the house churches. And he's really working it over to get them to try to stop this animosity, let their arms open up and accept each other as they are. Comments? Incidentally, that should probably be the same thing that should be happening in every church in the United States right now, but it doesn't. There are standards that are used to separate people and cause some people to feel that they are more superior or more spiritual than someone else. We are all beggars that have found the bread of grace. And that's what we hold to. And that's what establishes us as, uh, as God's family. So questions, comments? So I guess what Paul is ultimately trying to do here is give a comfort and a warning at the same time, a comfort to know that they were a part of a people that God initially chose to do his work, and yet a warning that they should believe and remain faithful to God by uh, accepting the grace that God offers. And then he opens up the can of worms. And the can of worms is that's what God does with Gentile people too. Salvation is by faith, not works. So any attempt on their part to press Gentiles to adopt the Torah has nothing to do with the right standing before God and therefore cannot lead to peace in the heart of the empire among God's people. So the surprising theology of grace is something that does not replace God's covenant, but ultimately fulfills it. And that is God has been gracious all along to a people that are named Israel, but now that door has opened to Gentiles as well. Don't be jealous. Don't be envious of it. Don't be mad or angry about it. Accept each other as recipients of grace. Thoughts? All right. Now, verse 11. So he's been talking really to the weak from chapter 9 through chapter 11, verse 10. And it seems now he's going to address the strong, which are the Gentiles. How do I know that? Because verse 13 says, I'm talking to you Gentiles. <laughs> it gets pretty straight there, okay? Uh, <laughs> so in verse 11, all the way down through verse 36, it seems at last he's going to address this other group. Now, let's think about Phoebe delivering this letter, and she's doing a little bit of performance art, reading this letter, 
And she gets to this section. And now she changes her gaze from looking at the Jewish constituency that's there and begins to look at the Gentiles. And he, uh, she is going to talk about maybe you have sat a little loose with the Torah and maybe your expectation that the weak should just abandon the Torah is a little bit over the top. You should respect their heritage. You should respect the fact that they've used Torah their whole life to structure their religious experience. So therefore, just you got to do your part too. So let's read just a portion of it. Verse 11, it says here, again, I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will be their full uh, inclusion? How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? He says here, I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will be their acceptance but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Okay. Oh, yeah. Simple, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> So now what Paul does is he says, yeah, a lot of his people fell aside. They, they actually reject their Messiah. They use the Roman Empire to crucify their Messiah. Um, Peter will get up on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and talk about the hardness of heart of the nation of Israel. Uh, by what they did. You have crucified the Lord of glory, he says. So he's going to use that to his own advantage here. And what he's going to do is he is going to say, okay, they have fallen, they have stumbled, they have rejected Messiah, and it has opened up the door to you, Gentiles. Now God says, step in and be part of this covenant people. And so here we find Paul is going to use the hardness that is found in the first, gener uh, first century Jewish people. And I'm, let me say this, let me qualify this. Doesn't mean every Jewish person was in favor of crucifying Jesus. However, when Pilate brings out Barabbas and Jesus, there's a dominant presence of of Jewish people there that are crying out for the release of Barabbas rather than Jesus. So that's kind of what's in mind at this point. They've rejected their Messiah. So now to get to the point of what he's trying to do here is he's going to talk about two things to rouse the jealousy of his own people. He's going to use the inclusion of the Gentiles as a way of creating envy within his own people. So it says in verse nine here that um, they had become a snare and, and a trap and a stumbling block. In other words, Jesus was somebody that the Jewish people tripped over. Um, and Paul will say, God allowed that. So to make them jealous, as we see in verse 11, they didn't stumble as to fall beyond recovery. No, they just fell down and God is using that to make them jealous. So what is Paul doing here? He is using a strategy that goes all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. Moses himself talks about, um, why, don't, if, why don't we turn back to this? Deuteronomy chapter 32, because I think it'll get to the heart of what 
um, Paul is trying to do in this chapter here. So Deuteronomy chapter 32. Important to remember that chapters 28 through 32 of Deuteronomy is talk, excuse me, talking about the blessings and the cursings of the Mosaic Covenant. When you get to chapter 32, what you'll notice is this is a song. It should be titled, if, there, if your Bible has headings and titles, it's called the Song of Moses. Yeah. And you'll notice that the text is indented like poetry. So what this is doing is it's recounting much of the history of the nation of Israel. And it's quite long, isn't it? Mm -hmm. all the way through chapter 32 and then right in the middle of it in verse 21 it says here uh well go up to verse 19 it says the lord saw this and rejected them because he was angered by his sons and daughters what he's talking about is following detestable idols verse 16 tells us and it says, I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. They made me jealous by what is no God and angered me with their worthless idols. Question, who is being jealous? This is God that's getting jealous. It's God is being referred to as jealous of what they did in following after other gods. So Paul is using a, a similar technique in his strategy to try to create jealousy in the heart of the chosen people. And what he is talking about is he preached to Gentiles. Many of them came to Christ. And as a result of that, these Jews over here, should be getting jealous that the Gentiles are getting in on the blessings of the Messiah. Okay. So what he's doing is he's using jealousy as a technique uh, of getting the attention of his own people. He learns that from Moses. That's what Moses is doing here in the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. And that's what Paul is doing in Romans 11. So jealousy is one technique that he's using. Notice on this slide, it's not the first time that God is claimed to be a jealous God. I put here some cross references that we're not going to look at tonight, but you can look at them yourself if you want. God is a jealous God, Exodus 20 and 34, and Deuteronomy 5 and 32, and Joshua 24. It's his response to idolatry, disobedience, and of course, chastisement that he brings upon his people. Ultimately, that's why they go into exile, into Assyria and into Babylon. So Paul is wanting his fellow Jews to repent from their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah to embrace him as the sent one. And uh, the first thing that he talks about is uh, the inclusion of the Gentiles was a technique that is being used to make the Jewish people jealous. Does that make sense? Any thoughts? It's interesting technique, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Israel will stumble over Jesus um, that is prompted by the Gentile belief, as I put on this slide here. Okay. Now, there's a correlation also that's going on here. That is, Israel's rejection means Gentile inclusion, and Gentile inclusion meet, means something as well. And what it means is eventually the fullness will, of, of the time that God is working with the Israelites will come in to play and, and God will include these Jewish unbelievers again. And that's what he says here in verse 12, 
the great riches will bring their full inclusion. Now, to get to that point, he uses two images. And the two images are found in verse 16. One is dough and the other is branches. Okay, let's, let's talk about that in a moment. So he's expanding his warning eventually in, in this text. When you come down later in the chapter, he will say to the Gentiles, hey, if God set aside the Israelites for a while, he can, do, he can start over with them and set you aside as well. Paul is just really, he's pulling out every mechanism at his disposal to try to get these two groups together. So he talks about the expansion and the warning and uh, what he will do is in between here, use these two images. So he doesn't expand upon um, this much, but the first image is dough. If part of the dough is good or holy, well, the whole thing is. But then he expands upon the second image, and that is the image of the branches. So verse 17, if some of the branches have broken off, speaking of Jews, and you, Gentiles, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. So he's saying, Gentiles, don't get cocky. You were grafted in to an already existing work that God is doing. He goes on, if you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. In other words, God is working among you because he first worked among the Jews. Verse 19, you will say then branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be, ar be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. <laughs> okay, Paul, so there's a warning that he's giving to say, God can discontinue his work among you. When we think of broken branches, we think of something that is broken off completely. Mm -hmm. But in the, um, in the study Bible that I have, the first century study Bible, there's a, there's a footnote here. And the word broken off is eklao. And the, the study note says this. I think it's helpful. This word means to break off or to break off a part, a part of something. A few scholars argue it means dislocated or bent, but not severed. This reading would suggest that the nat natural branches Israel could possibly be healed when the full number of Gentiles comes to faith. In other words, it's bent off, it's not broke off, and it can be re attached again after God has done and completed his work among the Gentiles. So I thought that was an interesting footnote. Um, the primary purpose of this metaphor, I think, is Paul's way of describing the precarious place the Gentiles are in um, to, to disregard Israel or to mistreat Israel because Gentiles are not grafted into, um, uh, Gentiles are grafted in. Uh, Israel's the natural, the natural uh, plant. Okay, again, tough metaphors, remnant, dough, olive branches, that type of thing. That's right. So Mark says he's not really talking about tree branches here. No, no, it's a metaphor. He's talking about people, the people of Israel, those that were disobedient or kind of broke off or bent over. God grafted in the Gentiles, but he can take that which has been bent over and re, re -graft it. That's the idea.
Do you see why people don't touch Romans 9 through 11 very often? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's not easy. So, but I think what Paul's ultimately trying to get at here is Israel's unbelief is a temporary status. Um, he's describing that they too can be in the center of God's work. And uh, that's what he's talking about here in verse uh, 22 and following. He says, consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. It seems as though everything is conditional here. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more ready, readily will these uh, natural branches be grafted into its own olive tree. So we have a master gardener online here. Um, I don't know how easy or how hard it is to graft things into other plants. Any comments on that? Well, it depends on the plant, whether it's likely to, to take or not. Rose bushes are a good example of things that get grafted together to make mm -hmm. a high. And an interesting thing, which I've been kind of looking for in here, but it was never brought up. If you, you have to plant a graft, also a apple tree is a good grafter. But if you plant and put the graft below ground, it's going to revert back to the original state. So it has to stay above ground? Yeah, the graft part. Oh, okay. Huh. Okay. So the grafting is always done up on the branch level, not near the root. Is that correct? It's up. That, that which is above ground, um, or at the branches, not at the, the lower you go, the more precarious it is, right? They do trees low, I mean, but you just have to watch your planting depths. Okay. All right. Same way. Interesting. I've never grafting anything in on a branch, but. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you say your grandfather did that? Didn't he graft something? What was it? Uh, do you remember? No. Essie was telling me, oh, this was several weeks back, about her grandfather who had a vineyard, right? And he was able to graft things in uh, together as well in his vineyard, but she doesn't remember how what it what it was exactly. But so you know, it's a practice okay. that has been done around the world, obviously, uh, by various people. Okay, well, this is ultimately what he's trying to get to here. Um, and that is Israel still has a redemptive future. Um, let's take a look at verse 26, or verse 25. And um, this, this is up for a lot of discussion among New Testament scholars. Um, it says here, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. And then he goes and he quotes again from the Old Testament about a deliverer that will come from Zion uh, and so forth. And um, here what we find is he's uh, quoting Isaiah again. And after that, he says, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are uh, loved on account of the patriarchs for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, um, uh, you have now received mercy 
as a result of their disobedience, so too they have now become disobedient in order that uh, they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For, uh, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that they, that he may have mercy on all of them. Okay, Paul, again, a lot of double talk going on here. So what, what do you need to know about this? When the topic comes up, so all Israel will be saved. Who is he referring to? Well, it could be all of ethnic Israel the entire Jewish population. And some, some models of eschatology says, well, that's, you know, all of Israel will come to faith. Dispensationalism is uh, one that proposes every Israelite will eventually be saved. But there are three other options here if you want to take a look at it. It's Israel in the flesh plus Abraham's faith descendants are, is what's in mind, or it could be Israel is being used as uh, a figure of speech to include the Gentiles. In other words, both Jews and Gentiles are included in the naming of Israel here. Uh, and then some suggest that it, it might be Israel as a metaphor for the church. So we don't know exactly what Paul is referring to. So my suggestion is this, don't build a whole lot of uh, es eschatology on this verse, which, you know, depending upon how people interpret certain parts of the Bible, they can, they can make some bad conclusions. And what I mean by that is, Israel can't do anything wrong. So, you know, in the whole Israel-Palestinian dispute that's gone on for ever, um, you know, no blame is ever laid at Israel's feet because they are still God's chosen people and they're all going to be saved. It can even play into moving, um, you know, the the capital or the, what is it that, uh, um, was moved, the, the embassy that uh, was moved to Jerusalem not too long ago. So you see how confusing this is? You be very careful not to get dogmatic about what this looks like into the future. Rather use the pastoral intent. Paul is using every technique in the book to try to get two groups that don't like each other very much to work together as brothers and sisters in the ch house churches in Rome. And I think that's the big takeaway of chapters 9 through 11, is this is not written to be put into a theology book. It's written to be put into the body life of these house churches. And I'm sure Phoebe had a lot of questions that she had to answer when she read this section to the house churches. I would have not wanted been in her shoes because unless Paul really groomed her well to answer these questions, I'm sure she would be just as confused as we are on some of, of the, uh, the things that come up here. So... Take a deep breath, and we're done with chapters 9 through 11. Now we'll go to the beginning of Romans starting next week, and we'll move forward, and hopefully you'll see how so much of this plays into Paul's um, um, overall purpose here in the book of Romans. And I want to applaud you. You had a lot of perseverance the past couple of weeks in these chapters. Uh, I pl applaud you for your perseverance and your willingness to still log in and be with us on Wednesday night because it's this is not an easy, this is not easy territory uh, to, to walk through, that's for sure. Any closing questions uh, for uh, our study tonight? Any thoughts? It's complicated. You know, I think some 
some of it like particularly around the, you know, Israel, the saving of, of Israel. You never, you know, that's when you just kind of, I don't, don't want to say blew past, but it's one I never really understood and never really tried to understand because it's, it's just so ambiguous and vague. I agree with you. And I think that, um, I think people, the only way they plow through it is to think that there's one viewpoint, I've chosen this viewpoint, and therefore it's the right viewpoint. And it's easy to get real dogmatic, um, but you gotta hold these chapters loosely. I think that's the best advice I can give because it, you know, it is very ambiguous. And especially to those of us that are sitting a few thousand years later, than when it was written. I agree with you. Other thoughts? Well, we'll close here for tonight and um, we'll get to the beginning of Romans next week, which should be a welcome relief to a certain extent, although there are some difficulties there as well. But, uh, you know, hopefully you're beginning to get the feel of the intent of the letter it is not written to be a theology book. It is written as a way to get the people of God to do the work of God. So, all right, we'll close there. I hope you have a great week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.